stuff. Yeah. Good. So I started investigating into some of the more extreme ideological justifications of this invasion. I'm going to present some of them to you. And of course, I know as little as anybody what goes on in Putin's head. I believe nobody can tell. Can tell. Uh, so all of this has a very conjecturous status. But still, I, I think there's at least some justification for making some pretty radical claims about exactly what is going on, given that the assumption that Putin is sane and depression actually uh, works from his uh, sincere beliefs in what the invasion of uh, the Ukraine is good for. I will, it wasn't, sorry, technical problem. The, the image that's, Okay. okay, now it works. Thank you. Okay, so my main claims are these. We must take seriously the hypothesis that the current Russian political elite is acting on what I shall call an amalgam of entrenched and extreme new traditionalist and new, new, or new racialist beliefs. Okay. So as as I'll point out, those beliefs in order to rationalize the invasion of Ukraine deviates from tradi traditional traditions and traditional Eurasianism in very important respects. Secondly, if this is correct, it has serious consequences for adopting the most rational response to Russia's hostilities towards Ukraine and the so-called global West. So I think there are some important common misunderstandings and until recently, probably I was as prone to those misunderstandings as anybody as the previous title of my <laughs> talk illustrates. The first idea is that traditionalism equals some kind of ultra conservatism. So whereas normal conservatives in the West want to dial back the clock to about 1950s, the Russian traditionalists want to dial it back to about 1650, right? Uh, but that, that's actually the misconception of what traditionalism is all about. Traditionalism really has nothing to even come with political conservatism in the wake of Berg and Hegel. First of all, traditionalists have absolutely no respect for cultural heritage and recent cultural and political history or for recent civic institutions and the history. They regard all of this as, as merely symptoms of, of, of constant decline, something to be dispensed with before a new golden age might appear. Secondly, in the, in the popular press, Eurasianism is often identified with Russian ultra-nationalism. Also, that's a complete misnomer. Because Eurasianism, concerns Eurasia, which is supposed to be some transnational geopolitical entity. So it has nothing to do with the, with the main tenets of a Russian nation state. In fact, it demands the absence of a Russian nation state. It demands Russians to lift themselves above petty concerns for their nations and take upon themselves the mission of ruling the entire Eurasian continent. So the, the relation between modern Russia and Eurasianism is really a, continu a contingent one. Yet people in this domain argue that Russia is the most promising center of power uh, in, a, in, a in a policy that will bring unity and stability to the Eurasian continent. But really, the, the relationship between modern Russia and Eurasian is, is, is pretty much a contingent. So the, the third misunderstanding is that, that this is all adequately made sense of in terms of fast. And I'm not going to say that Putin isn't the fastest <laughs> In some sense, he might be, but the label of fascism is very much overused and pretty much empty of content nowadays. Right? 
So calling Putin a fascist and calling the Putinist government a fascist government actually explains very little. It has nothing substantial in common with the Italian fascist and in for instance, except some superficial similarities. My personal is, suspicion is that whereas, whereas uh, the Italian fascists regarded the fascist states as a more or less an end in itself, you know, something to glorify, Putin more or less reluctantly has come to accept fascist uh, means of power as the necessary instrument for bringing about Eurasian rule and making Russia capable of exercising Eurasian rule. Okay. So if, if we look upon Putin's official justification for the invasion of the Ukraine, there are three main themes to discern from that speech. I, and I, I brought along lots of quotations, probably I don't have time to go through them all. Okay, so according to Putin, Russia has an alleged moral right, even a duty preemptively to clear its Western defensive units. So for instance, he said, he says, very shamefully, the, the attempt to appease the aggressor ahead of the great patriarchal war proved to be a mistake, which came at a high cost for our people. We will not let this, make this mistake for the second time. We have no right to do so. So really, he says, Russia has a moral duty to invade the Ukraine preemptively, because the last time when they were threatened from the West by Nazi Germany, they held back their horses and they were overrun by the Huns. Lots of Russians just died. So they have no right to make this mistake again. Then there's the motive of, of eradicism. So the Russian motherland, according to Putin, has some kind of historically ruined claim on Ukrainian territory. That he brings that forth in a number of quotations. He says, in territories adjacent to Russia, which have kept to note is our historical land, a hostile anti-Russia is taking shape, fully controlled from the outside. And he, he claims, he, he talks about that the historical homeland of, of Ukrainians is Russia. And he talks about our common motherland and the duty to defend the common Then, and, and, and this is a more of a clandestine justification, but I'm going to argue that this is in fact perhaps the most important one. Putin hints at there being a spiritual struggle between Russia and the West. So that Russia needs to bounce back in this struggle unless it uh, wants to risk obliteration. So he faces, he says, they sought to destroy our traditional values and force on us the false values that would erode us, our people from within, the attitudes they have been aggressively forcing on, our, on their countries, attitudes that are directly leading to degradation and degeneration because they are contrary to human nature. So he claims to stand for something that is natural uh, and, and he claims that he has a duty to stand up for those values unless uh, he, he, he will risk uh, the, the complete degeneration and degradation of Russia, which is a fate he insinuate has already uh, occurred in the West. And so on and so forth. Okay. So this raises at least four morbid puzzles. First of all, how can Russia portray itself as a complacent and rational part in attacking a much smaller and unusual state? How can Russia save and liberate the Ukrainian people and its culture by murdering, torturing, raping Ukrainians and bombing Ukrainians' heritage sites? How can Russia see a need to demasify Ukraine when it is led by a Jewish president and Nazi sympathizers um, make up a tiny fraction of the Ukrainian party. So certainly there are Nazi sympathizers in Ukraine. There are lots of them in Russia too, right? But all evidence suggests that they make up a tiny fraction of the Ukrainian army and the Ukrainian 
And fourthly, how can Russia see itself as the victim of global bullying and constantly ratcheting, ratcheting its impressive nuclear sabers and launching large scale military strikes, right? Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to assume that Putin isn't merely talking gibberish or that he isn't insane either. I'm trying to show you an ideology that makes all of that makes sense of all of this. But unfortunately, we have to dive pretty deep into, into fringes of the, of the current uh, intellectual climate. So bear with me, we're gonna see some, some strange beasts coming out. Okay, so first of, I'm, of all, I'm gonna point out that the, that the sort of more rational justifications by Western means are really moot. So the first theme also pushed by Putin in all of his speeches is, is Russia's um, right to a so-called cordon sanitaire, right? <laughs> a, a word, a French word expression uh, used a lot by Putinists. So cordon sanitaire, it sort of suggests cleanliness and, and uh, rationality. It really comes from the idea here you have sort of a, a colony of of uh, people infected with leprosy or something. And there around it, you have this white perimeter, which is the cordon sanitaire, right? So it's really sort of a, a no man's land of, of insulation required to spot enemies uh, a long distance and avoid contagion. So does Russia have, have such a right? And I, I'm with my colleague, Yevgeny uh, Balchenko from the University of Copenhagen, who has noted recently that many international so-called realist commentators mimic Russian rhetoric, right? And really uh, have become Putinist parrots, unfortunately. So they, they use terms that Russia has a de facto right to a sphere of influence, and they speak about the Russian cordon sanitaire, right? So here's uh, something I found on a Turkish political website. It says, by, I don't remember his name, but it's by a, a Turkish uh, social scientist. It says, Russia sees Ukraine as a gap in the Eurasian Center. This gap is so large that it can sink the Putin flagship project of Eurasian security architecture. The gap needs to be closed before too late. And here, more infamously, is Yuri Habermas. Same pretty much the same, <laughs> but in a more enveloped manner. Not that the war criminal Putin doesn't deserve to be brought before such a court, but he still holds a veto of the United Nations Security Council and can continue to threaten his opponents with nuclear war. So that, this past push, push and justifies that Putin is a big guy. Right? Putin is a big and important guy. An end of the war, or at least a ceasefire, must still be negotiated with him which means we must give in to Putin's demands because he's a big guy. <laughs> I see no convincing justification for demands for policy which, despite the excruciating, increasingly unbearable suffering of the victims, the fact of the risk of well-founded decision to avoid participation in this war. Which means, too bad for the Ukrainians, we must give in to Putin's demands to stay out of this conflict because he's such a big guy. And this has been said by Jürgen Habermas. <laughs> So in, in my term, in modest terms, this is complete BS. So, and it falls far short of sufficiency as an independent explanatory fact of rationally justifying the invasion. First of all, Russia has nuclear weapons, right? But so does France, Great Britain, Pakistan, etc. Russia is belligerent, but so is North Korea, even more so. Russia has a permanent seat at the Security Council, but they haven't been able to use it so much, right? Syria perhaps made a difference. But apart from that, successes are far between, seen from a Russian perspective. Russia stands over an impressive territory, so does Canada, Brazil, or Australia, right? Russia has vast natural resources, yet they're roughly equal Canada and Saudi Arabia combined. We wouldn't 
take and take seriously Canada's need for a cordon sanitaire if they were to invade Greenland. Okay, Russia does indeed have a glorious imperial past, but so does Great Britain and France also. Okay, if we look at the realities, Russia's gross national product, gross domestic product is, is at the level of Brazil, but with a far smaller population and a dire demographic future. Very few Russian children are born, Russian men are young, Russian productivity is declining, Russia only survives due to its vast resources of natural gold and minerals, natural gas and minerals. So why should anyone think on this basis alone that Russia merits such special duties? Would we take seriously a Brazilian claim for a cordon sanitaire comprising Paraguay, sort of the traditional enemy in many wars in South America? If, if the Brazilian army headed by Bolsonaro were to invade Paraguay, and say, we need to eliminate the spread of our borders. Would we take him seriously? No, we just say get over it <laughs> and get back home. So, so all the Western commentators who take this line is are just aping Putin's rhetoric models. Okay. Then there's the irredentism theme. So here we have on a map of Europe, the fabled Kiev and Rus, <laughs> the, the mythical original Russian empire um, <coughs> led by the so-called Ruridic dynasty back in the 1900s. So, for instance, Wall Street Journal has written the Russian world, the Rusty Mir, is the civil religion behind Putin's war. The Kremlin and the Russian Orthodox Church seem to retain as part of a cultural dominion to be protected from the values of an encroaching West. Right? And the dominion in, in, uh, in Putin's uh, speeches often is this. Okay. But really, the Tsarist empire of the Soviet state weren't really cultural dominions in any meaningful sense. They were multicultural, multi ethnic, multi religious. Also, even if they did, in fact, share culture, <laughs> that would be a pretty feeble uh, justification for, for annexation. For instance, my, my uh, native country of Denmark. Uh, we lost uh, the south of Sweden as part of our national territory uh, back in the 16th century. Then we regained it, lost it again a few times, and now it's on Swedish hands. We, we still share deep cultural ties, family bonds, even language with the Swedes living across Earth. So nobody in their right mind would suggest this was a just justification for annexing the south of Sweden. <laughs> So in itself, this also amounts to more or less uh, empty bluster, right? And now we are at it. If, if they really want to reunite the Orthodox world, why not Serbia or Greece, right? So the uptake so far is that we must take very seriously this implicit justification for the war in Ukraine, irredentism. And uh, the cordon sanitaire simply won't make the cut. They, are, they aren't really justifying reasons for this. So we, we must investigate this third line of thought that Russia has an imperative to bounce back in the life of the mortal class of cultures, which more or less amount to free beliefs. The belief that traditional Russian mores and hierarchies hold some kind of supreme value even outside Russian borders. The belief that Russian culture is involved in a zero sum life or death struggle with opposite alien cultures. And the belief that cultural and political domination of Ukraine is key to long term Russian survival in this war. So we should now turn to the intellectual underpinnings of those extreme beliefs. 
the question of whether they are mere delusions of paranoia and persecution, and whether they are then so-called epistemically innocent delusions. Good. So <laughs> I spent a lot of time on this guy. <laughs> Unfortunately, I came to the same conclusion as many others that 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 he is that he's a blowhard, really. <laughs> uh, so I spent far too much time on this guy, but I still think he holds some importance. So Alexander Dugin, born 62, is often referred to as having Putin's ear, uh, whatever that means, <laughs> or, or in, a, in a sensational new book by a guy called Millerman. This year, he's, he's called Putin's brain. I hope not. <laughs> um, some recent papers by Kalinin and Galeotti have very seriously investigated by empirical methods the actual impact of, uh, of Putin on the Russian elite. And they ha have more or less concluded that past his uh, academic tenure in 2014, <laughs> people haven't really taken him seriously. So it's not that, he, I, I believe that any theory that Dukin pulls serious strings in the Kremlin <coughs> is simply absurd. He doesn't pull any, so uh, he's despised by the Russian opposition to Putin, is not respected much by Putin either in his present sorry state. Still, I think he has some value because he dares to say very explicitly and openly what we might suspect the Kremlin sort of keeps under its hood. So he, so since he is basically, in my view, a sycophant who wants to curry favor with the Kremlin and wants to stand out as important, he offer, he very candidly offers the ideological justification for the Kremlin's actions that the Kremlin sort of crosses over with respectable talk of justice and international relations. So we might take him as, as Putin's Dugin's work as perhaps some kind of glimpse into the ugly underbelly of Russian uh, ideology. But I, I think we shouldn't exaggerate the extent to which this is true. Okay, uh, most commentators on Dugin have sort of uh, hold, held their noses very explicitly. You know, it's always, okay, they ask me to write about this terrible guy and, and I'll try to do it, but really, I think it's utter nonsense, everything he wrote, right? So here are some funny uh, assessments. And a, an article by Shepardsov and Umland, nine, he says, Dugin's neo eurasianism is the result of a syncretic combination bordering on random compilation of pseudo archaic conceptions with modernist and postmodernist postulates, which is just academic speech, but this is complete bullshit. Right? Here's Umland on his own. Dugin remains nevertheless an odd figure because of, among other eccentric announcements, the explicitly pro Nazi positions he voiced in the 90s, when still being part of and mainly addressing Russia's lunatic French, what he says here is. Uh, Dugin is a lunatic. <laughs> and here's Neuroman in the handbook on conspiracy theory. Dugin's book on conspiracy includes his articles of more than 10 years, but I tend to read it. It's evident that authors do change with almost every new book he <laughs> Means that <laughs> just blowing in the way completely inconsistent and new and regular, etc. etc. And here's Neuroman again claiming that Dugin has absolutely no intellectual fiber. He just tries to, to scare people. He's just a cheap fear. I, I think those assessments are too unfavorable. <laughs> even much, even if you can say a lot of unfavorable things about Dugin and his work just teams with a persistence. For instance, he's probably the most blatant anti Semite you could ever. Yeah, right. He even claims that modern Judaism is, is counter initiatory, which means that, that it's basically a pact with the Antichrist. <laughs> but still, he collaborates with Jews in Israel. <laughs> Just to mention one thing. Also, he places a lot of 
of focus on on uh, geopolitics and especially the importance of uh, of high margin analysis of the soil you were brought up on and the difference between the north and the south in terms of light and, and warmth. But then again, he claims that, um, that the Inuit, the native population of the Arctic region, regions are really southerners <laughs> that, has, that have pushed far north. <laughs> yeah, so if, if you want, you can just emphasize over and over the many crazy <laughs> aspects and, and obvious the contradictions. Okay. But I want to, I, I've done my best to take it seriously and, and find some modicum of sentiment. And it's true that Ugin applauds counterculture and strange political bedfellows in general and is prone to highly provocative and bizarre public ranking. For instance, his son is called Arthur Dugin, named after the Enfant, French Enfant Terrible and known bisexual as for Rambouf. <laughs> but publicly, of course, Dugin rages against homosexuality and French men in general. Also, that makes no sense. Okay. And, and to make matters even worse, he imitates the overloaded, overconfident literary style of his uh, idols, Louis Evil and the French around the Benoist, this 20 years of singing, right? They're just atrocious people to read, overloaded with obscure and unnecessary references. Okay. Yet I'll claim his more serious output, you know, in the essays where he clearly tries to be as serious as he can. He does provide a sustained effort to harmonize a set of polar opposites, at least some of which seem to be shared by the current Russian Putin network. And there are some fixed points amidst the chaos. <laughs> and I would say the, the primary fixed points are these. First of all, evil as version of integral traditionalism, which uh, we've been encountered as a young man, also translating uh, quite a lot of evil as writings to us. Then the Eurasianism and anti Semitism of Lev Gumilev, you know about him? <laughs> He's a great guy. In, Russian intelligentsia even has a big university in Kazakhstan named out. So he is one of many so-called Eurasianists who claims that there's a that there's a cohesive ethnos spanning the center of the Eurasian continent. And uh, the so-called Turanism of Felix Konetsky, who never gets mentioned by Dugin because it's a Pole, <laughs> so it doesn't fit into Dugin's family, <laughs> because he despises the Pole. Okay. Then there's Heidegger's middle period work, you know, the so-called black notebooks containing his so-called history of being, shifted his science. And finally, there's the geopolitics of uh, British ge geographers like Alfred Mann and Alfred Mackinder. So these are the st stable heroes in the Dugin's universe. And we'll now see what he makes. Okay. So he has basically three strategies for dealing with polar opposites um, in his worldview. First of all, he claims repeatedly that seemingly different polar opposites are really equivalent on a deeper or more sacred level. For instance, island versus continent Judaism versus Christianity, individualism versus collectivism, and so on. And it just so happens that Russia ends up on the good side every time. Okay. So a big part of his strategy is piling up polar opposites, claiming that they sort of match more or less exactly, give and take a few continents and countries, and, and then claiming that Russia is on the good side of so Russia is the continent versus the, the, the Anglo-Saxon islands. Russia is true Christianity as opposed to Judaism and, and uh, Christianity depraved by Judaism, which is Catholicism in this worldview. Russia is collectivism uh, versus the 
degrading individualism. So another strategy he pursues is that arguing that polar opposites, which seem irreconcilable, are really orthogonal. So if you can't align them, <laughs> square them, <laughs> that's the more this most. So he, he takes much pride in, in being the only one to understand Heidegger's obscure concept as a fiat, so -called, the so-called fourfold. He even claims that Russia's primary imperative is understanding Heidegger. <laughs> so here you have the, the, the East-West dichotomy versus the North-South, right? And he more or less uses the, the four corners of the compass and, and matches it it's onto his uh, evaluative scale. So Russia ends up, of course, in the sweet spot, which is the Northeast. <laughs> and, and then very importantly, some polar oppositions which might interest people like us are swamped into relevance. For instance, in this larger and sacred scheme of things, uh, matters like uh, individual well-being versus state interest, prosperity versus poverty, of mercy versus cruelty, of even of Nazism versus Judaism are dwarfed into insignificance. All of this matters absolutely nothing in contrast to these greater and deeper economies of the spirit. So it's not that he as such applauds cruelty or applauds poverty. It's just that it matters very little to avoid poverty or cruelty as opposed to saving the spiritual global Northeast, which is Russia. Okay, so the most important polar opposites to this uh, world picture, first of all, in time and space, the same so-called dimension of sacred history, which he takes from, from uh, traditionalist authors like Ebola and Henry Bignon, so these people operate for the glorious past. They like to throw around Hindu terminology. So it's the Sata Yuga, the Golden Age, versus the Iron Age, the present, the Kali Yuga. And, and I, as I shall explain later, the Golden Age is mythical. I right? can't get back to the Golden Age, but I believe honestly that Ebola and uh, Dugan think that you can still resurrect the Silver Age in Western the, the age dominated by warrior kings, blessed by the church. Then there's ecclesiastical history, the three great schisms. I left out the last one. Of course, the great schism of, of, of 1054, separation of the Orthodox and Catholic churches, but then there's an equally important, perhaps even more important, the schism to do in which is the schism of 1666, where the Russian uh, Orthodox Church was reformed on behest of the uh, Patriarchy of Constantinople. Right? And the Russian Church was then split into the so called old believers who were heeded by the accepted norms before 1666 and the new believers, which followed the, the official state church into the revised religion. And then of course, the latest schism is the schism between the Ukrainian uh, Patriarchy of Kiev and the Patriarchy of Moscow, which jointly condemn each other for heresy at the present moment. Then there are spatial opposites, in the so-called sacred geography of the Jewish Evola, the golden solar north, as opposed to the included lunar south. And the Eurasian heartland as opposed to the Western European and East Asian rimlands. So this notion of heartland versus rimland is taken from McKin Harold McKinder's geopolitics. So you have to consider the whole Eurasian continents from Vladivostok to the west of Portugal, right? 
And then the center of that is the heartland with Moscow. And, and around the center and its dominion, you have the Rimland, which is basically Western Europe and China. Okay, so in terms of politics and religion, you have the so-called sea powers versus so-called land powers and potentially Newton talks about the Thalassocracies, <laughs> Thalassos in Greek meaning sea, right? Versus Telluros, Tellur in Greek meaning land, right? And he sees those uh, geopolitical differences as inducing a spiritual difference. So the sea powers are meritocratic because their power relies on trade over the sea. So whomever is best at earning money and doing trade and navigating ships gets to be in power, whereas the land powers are more solid, briefly stratified as some kind of uh, embedded aristocratic system uh, rooted in, in possession of land. Then there's tradition, and now we finally get to what tradition means. So tradition means something like a human channeling of absolute truth and power. So traditionalists believe that there are absolute uh, moral truths and that only the blessed and initiate may have access to those truths and then uh, subjugate the rest of the population under the rule. And this is the only justice that can be in this world. <laughs> Whereas the West embraces the mystery of decadence, ruled by feeble passions and fallible science. Science, because of its uh, fallibility and its parliamentary structure, is absolute anathema, right? Because tradition is, re is revelation, it's revealed with overpowering force to the niche. Then there's initiation, which uh, into a, a spiritual reign, which Hume calls the order of the teaching heart, versus the so-called counter-initiation into the so-called order of the dead head. I guess <laughs> the part of this uh, youthful fascination with punk culture shot through that. And, and, and quite incredibly, the order of the dead head is, is identified with Judaism. <laughs> okay. So, so he literally be believes that, that, that at least the, the elite of uh, Judaist society are initiated into a pact of life. Take it or leave it. That's what he's, he claims. Then from Heidegger, he takes uh, a distinction between the sky, which is actualized being, and the ground, which is merely potential. And he also backs his poetic. So I should mention here the significant unorthodoxies in all of this. First of all, Lenny Cunon, whom you might know, was a French philosopher who chose to leave academia and become an Islamic mystic living in, uh, in Cairo. So Dinong is, is fiercely apolitical and, and believes that politics is merely degrading for the, for the initiated. Ebola, who, who is a pretty um, bizarre reader of Dinong, was a so-called regalist. So he believes that all earthly justice must flow through the power of a king, quite, 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 um, quite literally. So, so there can be no justice without a king who is somehow initiated into it. And, and I really noticed over time the similarities between all of this and, and so popular myths in Western culture like uh, Tolkien's Lord of the Ring. <laughs> With its return of the king, and the king returns, and everything is good. There are so many similarities to this, unfortunately. And then both of those people are extremely anti-populist. 
So here what I started out as a data is and Italian futurist, despise the common people, have absolutely no care for common people or their beliefs or traditions. The same for Guinong. Whereas, of course, uh, Rubin continuously stresses the authority and the, of the church and the people. So this is as anti-traditional as it gets. Okay, so so the traditional with a small t, traditional with a, with a capital T position was that that really what matters is channeling what uh, what I call the numen, which is which he it, which is different from the deus of God. So there are no gods in the traditionalist point of view. There's only force, a personal force which may be incarnate in the king, in the priest, the king. And Guinong then believed that the very last embers of the golden age was still lived in the Sufi traditions of Egyptian Islamic mystics, and that's why he chose to be initiated. So Dugin is as opposed to all of this as could be. And in geo geopolitics, if you look at the works of Harold Mackinder and other geopoliticians, well, most of it is obviously moot today because it relied on, on 19th century logistics, 19th century alliances and stuff and stuff, right? But the heartland was really considered from, from a geographical perspective. Where are the natural resources? Where are the natural lines, lines of defense? So such as mountain ranges, et cetera, where are the major rivers, where are the population centers, et cetera. So the heartland was really a concept of logistic, natural resources and defensive capabilities. Whereas Dugin seems to think of, of it as a, some kind of political and spiritual phenomenon. So right now, Dugin thinks that, that the entire American continent is an island spiritual speaking, because it's American, it's the center of American talent. But given the success of rural Trumpians, this, the rural USA will be transformed into American heartland. Okay, if you go by Eurasianism and Turanism, really, this was a quite thoughtful ethnographic doctrine in its days, right? So it was conceived of by Russian emigre social scientists who tried to prove through linguistic um, analysis and ethnographic research that a common ethnos had once ruled the Eurasian uh, steppes, sort of the center of the Eurasian continent. But Dugin seems to care a little about ethnographic evidence. Rather, he sees myths of past Turanian glory as an inspiration for Russian people. For instance, he writes, we, the Russian Indo-European people, are the keepers of this gigantic territory of Turan. The mission of the Indo-Europeans has made a full circle starting with Indo-Europeans and ending with Indo-Europeans in coming to us. So he wrote that in 2018. And of course, who are the Turanians? Well, on any respectable ethnographic theory, the very existence of Turanians is pretty disputed. But if they existed, they were mostly Turks. <laughs> Whereas uh, Dugin impressed with the martial and <laughs> combative qualities of the Turanian horsemen places them at the Russian steppes, right? Completely nonsense on an ethnic level. And if we turn to Orthodox Christianity, well, Dugin is, uh, is a member of the so called ideology, the old ritualists of the Russian Orthodox Church. So those are not full old believers in that they bow to the patriarch of Moscow, but still they, they refuse to use the, the official. Liturgies of the Russian Orthodox Church and prefer the liturgy 
pre-1666. And, and Dugin has claimed that 1666 was the most important event in human history because there the, the Russian Orthodox Church has severed its ties to tradition. <laughs> And, and then again, the Moscow Patriarchy, headed by uh, the Patriarch Cyril, in recent years have strayed pretty far from the Orthodox Church in general, so far that other patriarchs are calling for this um, extradition and uh, excommunication for the very reasons that we do not also. Okay, so what is all of this about? And I'd say, Basically, it's about the re-enchantment of the world. So Dugin, like many others, have feel a, a, a deep-seated disgust with the modern world. Like he, he grew up as a dissident in, in the latest year of Soviet Russia, thought that, that opening up to the West, West might bring new opportunities and and some kind of purpose to life, which was pretty dreadful <laughs> in the Soviet Union. But then, like, like other people, he was disappointed with the West. Really found very little of value there in his mind. So he, he took up a full front with his own um, fascination, able act, and, and claims now that initiation brings none less than real magical powers, which he calls like even a spiritual reality. So for instance, Ebola writes, one would look in vain a religion in the original forms of the world of tradition. The human, unlike the notion of Deus as the greater came to be understood, is not a being or a person, but a sheer power capable of producing effects, of acting and of manifesting. So the people in possession of this tradition, the king, the priest king, will appear magic to his subjects. The sense of the real presence of such powers on Umna as something simultaneously transcendent and yet imminent, marvelous, that fearful, constituted the substance of the original experience of the sacred. And what he means there is that the king and the kingly caste, sort of the top echelon of traditional society, is transcendent to the common people. They appear mystical and dark with magical gifts as considered from the common people's perspective. But it's also imminent in that it's actually human beings of flesh and blood who incarnate these powers and use them for, for the nation. And here's Dugin in a manifesto. Only the direct total replacement of art and politics with magic can save the society. Degree and ta of talent and ideological success now directly depends on degree of acquaintance with our culture doctrines. And he seems to mean this very seriously. And he despises modern chemistry and and um, and, and physics for its efforts to 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 make to profanize. The world. To explain away what appears like it. And a part of this magic is cognitive magic. <laughs> now we're moving closer to truth and finally. So, an essential part of traditional magic is cognitive magic, direct and overpowering knowledge of absolute principles of social justice, at least as valid for so called spiritually superior races like the Eurasian people. Really, I, I think. Dugin and his consorts are deeply pessimistic about inducing any kind of order or justice in the Western world, because those are too depraved for salvation. All that matters is saving the Russian world and making sure it is governed from above by the insights of space. So the global West and South had squandered the last embers of golden age in education. Only Eurasia has the potential of having the basis, but the means of wealthy justice must necessarily spring from Eurasian sacrality. And since tradition is universally valid for the human species, any Western claim to a priority education at favor of principles like human rights must be frozen. And, and, and so my claim is that to really rationalize this, you, you need 
to bring in big guns like this because one thing is some kind of Russian dude thinking, mm -hmm, it seems to me that human rights are moods and uh, subservient to the pursuit of Russian glory. <laughs> but why would this seeming or intuition be endowed with such authority, right? There are many, there's a lot of discussion of such things in the epistemological literature. Why would you think your intuitions are reliable? We need some justification for this, right? Because people intuit lots of things that have turned out false. And I believe traditionalism offers such justification. It, it says that your intuitions are reliable because you belong to the regal race of this sweet spot of sacred geography. It's a weird explanation, but it's the explanation we can give. So, what does Vladimir Putin have to do with this? Because obviously, so far, Putin has done everything to appear like a sensible state. So Putin would never start rambling about traditional magic or something like that. But still, he throws a lot of bones. And conspicuously, he throws very many bones to this kind of ideology and terminology. So if you read his essays from 2021, which is more or less the ideological blueprint for the invasion, he, for instance, he describes Ukraine and Russia as parts of what are essentially the same historical and spiritual space. He has a concept of spiritual space, which more or less aligns with the idea of sacred geography as being some kind of spiritual division of the world world really uh, plainly geographical. Then he quotes the so-called Silver Age Guridic priest king, Oleg the prophet. So Oleg the prophet was the nephew of Rurik himself, the mythical established girl of the first Russian empire in the 19th century. And Oleg wasn't merely a king, a very successful warrior king. He was also a priest, a prophet. Who, who pronounced that Kiev be the mother of all Russian cities, right? So it's quite significant then that in an essay playing into real politics, he quotes a ninth century warrior priest. And very seriously, he, Putin makes any effort to, to say at the beginning of the essay, still, these are my firm beliefs. I'm very serious. I thought long about this. Everything I write here is sincere, relevant. And of course, this priest king, only the prophet, is very much an icon of the Silver Age. So the Golden Age is the original splendid mythical times when priest, when the when the roles of priest and king coincided. So the king was literally sacred. The person of the king was, was sacred because he channeled this traditional virility and power, right? And the Silver Age is then where the priests could and, and, the, and the ruling uh, warrior class are divided, but still mutually support and legitimize each other. And then of course, the, the, the Iron Age where we now live is the age of complete amorphism without respect for, for, for tradition where people are exalted to high office because of their fortune or their, uh, their biological, <laughs> stock and are not screened for spiritual, spiritual virility. <laughs> Sorry about talking about all this kind of virility, <laughs> but it's essential. So he says, Putin, and these are the words of Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, the spiritual choice made by some Vladimir, who was both Prince of Novgorod and Grand Prince of Kiel, still largely determines our finished today. So basically he says that there was a sacred priest slash warrior king who determined the fate of people 1,100 years later. And why? Because he initiated them into, into the Orthodox faith. So by becoming initiated into the undiluted Orthodox Christianity, he determined the future uh, normative duties of the all Slavic peoples. 
And then he refers to Ukraine explicitly as periphery, which is rim language, <laughs> as by the old Russian meaning. So anybody in the know would know that periphery equals rim language, rim and heartland. He, and now, of course, it gets more sensitive. He talks about the southwest of the Russian Empire as being the most stubborn part, impervious to orthodoxy, right? So this mimics against the sacred geography where the southwest, so the worst part, the worst corner of the world where tradition, which, which currently allegedly now only survives in the form of orthodox Christianity, will not permit uh, the, the base instance. So by saying that the Southwest was the least orthodox part of the empire, he again speaks into this world. And then he describes Ukrainian sovereignty as merely the program of the Polish national movement, which means a program of Catholicism, uh, depraved Christianity, ruined by Judaism and divisive nationalism. And, and now comes, we get to the really weird stuff because Putin, after the publication of this article where he sort of makes an effort to appear scholarly and, and sensible, he gave an interview which was published on the Kremlin's website where he's obviously more loose and speaks in the vernacular. And then he says even weirder stuff. For instance, he says, Stalin was really an Orthodox Christian at heart because at the most decisive moment in his reign, when Russia was invaded by Nazi Germany, he addressed his compatriots as fellow members of the Orthodox Church by a special code. And Stalin also was always right about Ukrainian subordination to Russia. So Stalin was not only an Orthodox by heart, he also channeled tradition by, by keeping alive the whole initiation of St. Vladimir. <laughs> okay. And uh, <laughs> I was partly amused by this even in these dire times. So, so one, one piece of evidence Putin quotes in favor of the true Russian na nature of Belarusians and Ukrainians is that hockey players, when they swear on the court, use Russian expressions. So meaning that, and you know that Putin has often played hockey himself publicly to demonstrate his virility and regards hockey as the virile sport, the manly sport number one. So basically what he says here is that when Ukrainians and Belarusian men are at their most virile in the heat of passion, their inner Russian nature shines forth from their collective unconscious. Okay, so these are wild claims, but these are the claims of the president of Russia. So I just want to show you that the, the bridge between Putin's ramblings and Putin's aren't that wide, unfortunately. Yeah, it's looking for about an hour. Oh, I'm sorry. The time. Okay, I'll try and, and see if I can land this soon. Okay, even more worrying, the teaching of, of the current Moscow Patriot. So the Patriarch of Moscow, the, the Cyril, the leader of the Moscow Patriarchy, he, he has recently espoused the conception of the Holy Ghost as simply divine energy eternally originating from God the Father. Okay, what which means literally that the Holy Ghost is no longer an aspect of the Father, but is something this pure energy originating from the Father. So, so really he equates more or less the Holy Ghost with the pure impersonal power traditionalists worship. He has only advocated Roscoe Mir geopolitics with subversion of Eurasianism, the, this, the, the notion of a cohesive Russian world. And he maintains close ties with modern Swan Stalinists. For instance, Kennedy Sugano, who is a well-known modern Stalinist, with Stalin and a big culture of Stalin <laughs> on his desk. On, on the, the occasion of Sugano's birthday, Cyril publicly uh, wrote him a letter of congratulation, 
we're hoping for his moral transformation of society, which seems to indicate that he sees um, the core of the Orthodox creed as, as being above uh, confessions. So even Stalin and Stalinists can be the true vessels of, uh, of orthodoxy by somehow channeling this divine energy. And of course, this is other Russian, other patriarchs of the Russian church have called for his excommunication over this. So even by Russian orthodox standards, this is very bizarre, but it aligns perfectly with these traditions too. So what comes of all of this? And, and see here the Eurasianist logo, which is sort of a, a sign with arrows in all directions, sort of expanding from the heartland. <laughs> Pretty ominous, right? So Russia lies in the sweet spot of global sacred geography, this Northeast, which is mythically the land of dawn and ice. Ice being white and splendorous, right? So even if currently under siege, only Russia retains the potential for populist and nations due to following the authentic initiatory capacities of the Rus Moscow Orthodox Church, at least in its own ritual form, and admittedly some Islamic and Hinduistic sects. <laughs> its geographical isolation from Talasocratic mercantilism and thus from cultures of meritocracy and capitalism. Its imperial multi ethnicity, ethnicity shielding it from nationalistic petty mindedness, and its command of the Eurasian heartland, which is the natural uh, uh, bastion of Eurasian continent. So, Dugin's um, infatuation with counterculture has ended up in this that. That Russia enshrines the principle of global count, the last beleaguered holdout for the embers of tradition in the otherwise depraved Iron Age. And, and if Putin really subscribes to this, even marginally, it is very bad news because it means that he, that he attributes to anything outside this last holdout for tradition absolutely zero value. So we, as we sit here, are worth nothing because we are utterly and, um, and irredeemably depraved. Our only importance is, our, is the risk of, of contagion, that our false values might tempt Russians to, to leave their spiritual home. So we can be dispensed with, even must be dispensed if, if necessary, to save the last embers of this. So why is Ukraine so important? I'll stop here. Because Ukraine has set the worst possible example for former Soviet Republic and the Jewish people. First of all, it Ukraine has induced yet another schism in the Orthodox Church. And as we know from the ramblings of Putin and Putin, uh, schisms within the Orthodox Church is the worst possible thing because it sort of spreads the last powers that may support tradition. And uh, even worse, Ukraine has uh, adopted for trade with the West. It has approached mercantile modernization, thus becoming a vessel of phallocratic empire. And ignoring its location in the heartland, it has degraded itself to the status of yet another Western Union. So if Ukraine falls, this might doom any dream of Eurasian imperialist Alinginesis. They are headed by a new priest king, like the old princess of Novgorod. Okay, so this be my analysis of the situation, and I have more slides, but 
I should stop now. So thank you.